Gary Greenwald. This unique program combines the dynamic ministry of God's Word, the discussion of contemporary issues, and the demonstration of God's power. Now, here's Gary Greenwald. I'm Gary Greenwald, and over the past several years, the Eagle's Nest Ministries has exposed certain things like rock and roll music, Dungeons and Dragons, marijuana, and even the New Age movement, and now we feel there's another attack upon our society. If I say something like wicked witches and demon clouds and spell books and even the zone of eternal evil, what comes to mind? What do you think of? Do you think of a coven of witches or a seance? Watch now. Wicked witches, demon clouds, where do we start, Mr. Van Gogh? You start by getting that spell book before those foolish witches destroy the world. We've got some witches to splat. You coming with us, Mr. V? I'm afraid I cannot. Like we're not into witches either, sir. We'll stick with you. <laughs> if you wish, I'm going to hunt down that demon mist in the zone of eternal evil where the darkest spirits are trapped. <laughs> Like on second thought, send us a postcard. <laughs> Good luck with the mist, Mr. V. If they don't recover that book, no amount of luck will save us. Oh, powers locked within this stone, transport me now to the evil zone. You know, you've been watching a Scooby-Doo cartoon, and it's amazing to me to see what's being brought forth in a cartoon. We've seen spell books, occultic amulets, we saw a crystal ball, astral projection to the evil zone, all of this in a children's cartoon. Now, I've got a guest today. His name is Phil Phillips. He's from Texas. He has been involved in missions work in his life, and he has now felt called to study the effects of cartoons and children's toys and even TV programs upon our children today. And I'd like to introduce a young man, and uh, Phil, uh, God bless you, and it's uh, good it's to see you today. It's a pleasure being here today. Gary. Now, Phil, I'll tell you what, 14 years ago, Scooby-Doo was a lot different than what we see today and I could hardly recognize it. Can you tell me what's going on in this cartoon? Yes, there's a vast movement toward the occult within the cartoon and toy industry. Most people don't realize that 80% of all cartoons deal directly with the occult, and 40% of the toys on the market have occultic influence, and these are the most popular. And these toys are actually a mirror of the cartoons, is that correct? Right, they are released together. It's a form of marketing where the toys and the cartoons are released together to create this popularity for the toys. Now, you have a concern. I know that all of this is affecting our youth, and I wanted to know, do you feel that there are a lot of children that are being influenced by the cartoons they watch? Oh, yes. Uh, take, for instance, a cartoon like He-Man and Masters of the Universe. It can be seen as many as 31 times a week in an area where the viewing audience, as much as 16 million children each time it's aired. And so we're seeing a vast effect on the whole United States and other countries around the world through these cartoons and toys. Millions of children now watching occultic cartoons and then going out and buying occultic toys. Now, could we say that there is witchcraft and occultic practices that are actually being portrayed in these cartoons? Oh, yes. The witchcraft and, and occult practices are not make-believe. They're taken from actual witchcraft, actual pagan religions, levitation, mind control, astral projection, and other forms of, of witchcraft ceremonies are portrayed within the cartoons. All of these things are portrayed in the cartoons? Yes, could, very much so. Well, then we could suspect that there's some kind of a spiritual force behind these things to program our children. Oh, yes. The children receive this in a, in a very different 
light than we do. Well, Lynn, before we talk about that, let's go into another Scooby-Doo cartoon and let's see some of the occultic and witchcraft influences that are very blatant in this cartoon. Let's go to Scooby-Doo again here. Okay. But how did you wind up in the zone? Oh, I was swept here by a spectral wind after I escaped your chest of demons. Mm -hmm. From one trap to the next. <laughs> you never were terribly clever, were you, Marcella? No! <laughs> oh, yes, Van Gogh. While you rot here, my sister witches will set me free at last to haunt the heavens and the... In a short while, Vincent, my loyal sisters will rescue me from this zone. I wouldn't count on those three witches if I were you, Marcella. Oh, I do appreciate your concern, but with the Book of Spells, they can't fail. Once they reach Stonehenge and make a brew, they'll chant Spell 13. Which will set you free. Precisely. And I'm afraid you can't follow me, at least not without your lovely necklace. I can hardly believe what I'm seeing here. Now, we're looking at occultic things. We're thing seeing things like the chest of demons and witches and stone hedge, uh, henge and occultic uh, spell 13. I mean, we're talking about satanic things here. Now, Phil, it's becoming obvious to me what's going on, and I wonder how did you get started in exploring all of this? I mean, how did you get into analyzing the toy industry? Well, it was very unusual. I was in the process of going on the mission field and working my way through that and speaking in different churches the Lord directed me to go on a 14-day fast and during this fast I did something very unusual I walked into a toy store mm -hmm. uh, and when I walked into the toy store I was faced with a toy holding an occult symbol in its hand and this got my curiosity up so I purchased the toy and I read the comic book that was with it and it was occultic practices within the comic book so I talked about it in the church I was in that night but I didn't think much of it. I threw it in the back seat of my car. About three days later, I was driving home from these series of services, and the Lord spoke to me about what happens when a child plays with a toy and how they project themselves with their imagination into a toy, and they give it life, character, abilities, talents, and they set the surrounding around the toy. Now, wait a minute. Now, you're saying a child actually projects himself into the toy. Can you, can you say that again? Because I think that's, that's a real key here that the uh, cartoons have this kind of effect upon the child and even the toys. Yeah, the, the toy is a lifeless hunk of plastic and it only comes to life with that projection of the imagination into a toy. Yeah. And they give it life, character, abilities, talents, and set the surroundings around the toy. So the child vicariously lives through that toy. Yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. And the Lord told me that, that children were being affected by these things and that I was to do something about it, which proceeded in me starting studying this material over two and a half years ago. Well, we've seen over the last several years a, a slow, subtle, uh, occultic influence in our cartoons, but it's become so blatant when do you feel this blatant turn towards the occult and witchcraft really took on its momentum? Well, there's a cartoon called He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Now, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe really broke the ground on this cartoon occultism. In fact, it set so many records. It was turned down by all three major networks, by the way. It was the first cartoon to go through independent TV stations as a first-run cartoon, and it covers 95% of America. So you're saying He-Man 
was like a, an occultic forerunner to really blast this into the public's eye. Oh yeah, they, the cartoon uh, people have no problem getting another one through. They say, well, it's just like He-Man. Hmm. But He-Man was such a tremendous success. In fact, it got as much as a 22-point Nielsen rating in many areas when it was shown. And that's market control, as you know. Well, I think what we should do is let's watch on the screen right now and see an opening to a He-Man series and see some of the occultic overtones as we begin this. We're going to play a little segment here showing the transformation of He-Man. Power of Rayskull! Now, Phil, here we're seeing a transformation of He-Man from a wimp, like a Clark Kent type of character, to the He-Man, and he says something uh, like the power by the power of Grayskull, is that correct? Yes, what you just seen is He-Man uh, being transformed. In fact, his name is Adam. Yeah. First oh, man. Interesting. Until he's transformed, and then he becomes He-Man, the most powerful man in the universe, by lifting his sword in the air and yelling by the power of Grayskull. Now, to understand this, we have to understand what Grayskull is. It is a castle built by unknown hands in the shape of the skull, and there's a demon spirit living within it that manifests in the shape of a skull. And so our good character is empowered by occultic demon spirits. You're kidding me. No. So all of this is coming forth and the children, whether consciously or, or subconsciously, are picking up all these occultic overtones. Oh, very much so. You know, I received this letter. I thought I might read it here. A lady had written to the Eagle's Nest and she said, how harmless are the cartoon characters on the Masters of the Universe program for children? My sister-in-law allows her son to watch this television show and he also has all the characters, He-Man, Skeletor, who you see on the screen right now, and the castle of Grayskull, to which this little two-year-old boy repeats from the show by the power of Grayskull. Here's a little boy repeating, two years old, by the power of Grayskull, and she says he holds his hand up, saluted to the sky. So a two-year-old is actually learning these things. Well, the Bible says, dear children, let nothing take God's place in your heart. Right. And He-Man is being lifted up as a god, and many children are receiving him as such. In fact, I was talking to one lady, and, and I've heard a number of experiences like this, but she said, my little boy was in the back seat of the car, and a radio preacher came on and said, our Lord God, the master of the universe. And her boy jumped from the back seat of the car and said, Mommy, God isn't master of the universe. He-Man is. What? A little boy said that... He-Man is the master of the universe? Oh, even more so. I've got another one. My dad was talking about my presentation in a church, and a little boy was seen afterwards. I mean, I didn't even do the presentation. And afterwards, he was seen in the parking lot. Now, this is a kid growing up in a Christian home, going to church, Sunday school, the whole shot. Right. Out in the parking lot with He-Man in his hand, running around in circles, saying, He-Man has more power than Jesus. He-Man has more power than Jesus. So... So we can assume that millions of children that you say watch these programs are having their minds transformed from reading the Word of God or believing what the Bible says to believing what the cartoons are saying. They have that kind of influence on their minds. Right. They're taking on many gods. Many gods. Well, let's look, at a, let's look at what this is spawning in our toy stores. Each cartoon is spawning little toys that represent the cartoon. Is that correct? Right. All right. Then I'm going to show you a He-Man figure here. And he's got this, uh, what do you call this sword here? Uh, well, that's the sword of power. But as we've talked about He-Man, he becomes transformed. Now, from He-Man, we need to take a look at Skeletor. Okay, now this is the He-Man, a muscular figure and mm -hmm. so forth, that mostly little boys follow, I take it? Right. But the little girls have someone, too. Oh, many little girls play with this toy. Oh, really? Well, yeah. let's look at Skeletor now. We've got him up on our screen. And Skeletor is this ugly-looking uh, skeletal creature with a staff in his hand. Now, what's that staff that he's got in his hand? 
the staff is a ram's head staff. Now, the ram's head is a very occultic symbol. It's boiled in cauldrons. It's used in different occult practices. But when it's seen on the staff, it's called a norok. And when the norok is pictured in occult books, many times it's pictured with the butt of the staff crushed onto the head of a dove. Now, Skeletor introduces most of the occult within the toy series. He has the ability to mind control, to levitate, to astral project, and, and to do many other occult practices and pagan religion practices. So you're telling me little boys, for instance, could watch Skeletor with his staff of power here and they could, and you say this was actually used to crush a, a, a dove that represents total satanic power. Of course, we know that the goat's head, the ram's head, represents Satan anyway in the yeah. occult. So little boys are really being programmed to evil. And where does Skeletor live? Well, Skeletor lives in Ethernia with He-Man. Now, Ethernia is a good world that they live in, and we'll, we'll see some things about Ethernia a little later on. Now, who lives in Snake Mountain? Well, Skeletor lives in Snake Mountain. Could we talk about Snake Mountain? For sure, let's take a look at it. Now, we, we have a toy that we got at the store, which is uh, called simply Snake Mountain. I thought I'd get this toy up here, if we can get that on the screen. And uh, here's the snake and all. I mean, this is definitely an occultic toy. And it's got an interesting little feature here. I'm going to turn it on. It can actually transform your voice from uh, your regular voice to that of an occultic hero. Is that yeah. correct? So let's get a Skeletor type of voice. <laughs> Let me turn this on here. I, I think I'm getting it too loud. Skeletor the master of the universe. Does that give you kind of an example of... Uh, yeah, you should see the commercial they play with it. You know, it transforms your voice into that of an evil... So you know, little voice. children would... Little children would actually use that to even identify more with these occultic heroes, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, it would be interesting if we went to another video showing even more of the occultic overtones in these uh, different characters. So let's go to another He-Man serial right now showing the occult. You have a great challenge facing you, He-Man. Perhaps the greatest of your life. Have you ever heard of the Star Seed? I thought it was a myth. It is no myth. It is real. And it is right here in Eternia. Let me show you in the mirror. Eternia is an unusual planet, for we are located directly in the center of the universe. It was here where we now stand that the explosion took place which created the universe billions of years ago. At the very center of our planet, there is a small piece of the energy left from that explosion. The very energy which set the stars burning and the planet spinning. The star seed. Speak a thing to the star seed and it makes it happen. It can do anything. It is all powerful. For untold ages, the location of the star seed was known only to a chosen few of the cosmic enforcers. But its location is no longer a secret at this very moment. Skeletor is tunneling his way to the center of Eternia. Can you imagine what would happen? Is, is this possible, Phil, as we're watching this witch talking? She's talking about the creation of the universe, how it was created with a great big explosion, or what uh, some of the scientists would call the Big Bang Theory today, which yeah. totally throws out creationism. And then we see her saying the star seed is all powerful, and she mentions Skeletor and Castle Grayskull, which we'll get to a little later. But all of this, I mean, we're seeing such occultic overtones, and this uh, segment we just played was not something we looked for. We just turned on the TV and recorded the first segment we saw. Isn't that correct? That's right. Well, I want to get back to uh, exposing some of these right. uh, characters that we see in the cartoons. So, Phil, would you tell us about the characters we're seeing on the screen right now? Well, we have a good versus evil here battle, but the good is empowered by satanic power. This is Tila. They call her the warrior goddess or the patron saint of all warriors. You notice that she's wearing a cobra head breastplate and has a cobra head staff in mm -hmm. her hand. Now the cobra is the symbol for demonic power and protection. And this young lady is involved in witchcraft and you notice that she's a very voluptuous looking thing and they wear very tightly clad clothes and, and sometimes even negligee 
type things on the show. So there's a sensuality about the toys also. Yes. This character is called Many Faces. Now, in a, in a cartoon, Many Faces becomes demon-possessed by drinking a magical potion that Skeletor gives him. Now, he is, he is released from that, he becomes a good character, but he still has the demon living within him, and every once in a while it wells up inside and makes him an evil character again. <laughs> so he crosses back and forth. You mean little children with a Many Faces toy, now I've got the little Many Faces toy here, can actually see him transform from a demon-possessed uh, skeleton type of creature to a good guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and back. I guess what you do with the toy, if we might try it here, is you can turn this little deal and you can make his face change. There you go. And there he becomes a, a good guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the little child can, there's several faces, the many faces in this little toy, which change, but you know, you can become a skeleton creature and we can go around to the different faces. And this has got to have some kind of a message to the children. Oh, definitely. It says you can be demon possessed and still be good. Uh, you're kidding. Yeah, that's the, what, you know, if you have a demon living within you and then you're playing on the good side, then you, that's the obvious inference there. This character here is called Stratos. They call him the Winged Lord. He has the ability to fly and to shoot fire from his hands. You'll notice that he's a half man, half bird. Yeah. Now this is an inference from the gods of the ancients. They're half men, half beasts. This particular one is the sun god Ra. He's becoming a very popular revival within the toy and cartoon series, as we'll see in some of the other cartoons later on. We're going back to ancient pagan gods and forming our toys after them. Right. Oh my, my. Right. What's, what's our next toy here? Well, we're going to take a look at some of the actual cult practices within the cartoon series, and part of the way I do that is to look at the comic books that come with them. This is the PowerPoint Dread. Now, in the PowerPoint Dread, we see Skeletor in a classic lotus position of meditation. Legs crossed, palms on the knees, he with the palms out. He is levitating off the ground. In a yoga type position. Right. He has a power beam coming from his head holding a crystal ball. Crystal ball is used in necromology or communication with the dead. Right. And he's talking about that this crystal ball is the only thing that will allow him to focus all of his psychic energies. That's on the first page of one comic book. I can't believe this. And so there's all kinds of occultic things happening right in the front right. of the comic book here. And now? This one's the magic stealer. Now, in the Magic Stealer, Skeletor introduces the power of the pyramid cult. Now, he walks to the center of the pyramid, he sits inside, and he starts to steal the power of Ethernia. Now, Ethernia is the good world they live in, mm -hmm. and these are the powers that rule that good world. This fiery serpent, these fiery skulls, this gargoyle. Do you know what they call these things? No, what? The spirits of the air. Spirit, well, and that... That's Ephesians 6.12, isn't right. it? Where we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual power, spiritual wickedness, principalities, principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, the powers of the air. Or the spirits of the air. The spirits of the air and the rulers of darkness of this world. So actually these cartoons are making real what Satan has had for a long time. Right. When I was brought up, I watched cartoons like Bugs Bunny, uh, Donald Duck, Daffy Duck, I mean, Elmer Fudd, and all of the Looney Tunes. But today, there's a different kind of cartoon that's coming on our TV sets. And the question is, is there a well-organized plot, an insidious design right now to program and influence the minds of our children towards the occult and witchcraft? We see things like spell books and witches and zones of eternal evil and all kinds of demons in today's cartoons. And we're discussing today with our special guest, Phil Phillips. And Phil, I'd like to welcome hey, you to the program. God here. bless you. Phil comes from Texas, and Phil has been doing a tremendous, tremendous intensive study of the cartoons that children view today. He's looked at the toys that they're buying in the toy stores, at the comic books that they read, and he's seen that they vicariously live their lives through these cartoon characters and toys. Now, if we miss the generation of youth that's coming up, if we do not minister to them the Lord Jesus Christ, then we've lost the generation of tomorrow and the Antichrist will have them. I believe the Antichrist is trying to program the minds of our youth and he's getting his spell, his control on their minds. And today we're going to be talking about those youth. 
Now, in God's economy, children are very important. And I wonder, Phil, if the church is overlooking the children. Do you think this is happening? Well, on, in church history, yes. The church has overlooked the children on many occasions. Some people, in trying to, to put emphasis on the children, have said that children are the church of tomorrow. But that's not a true statement. Children are the church of today. They're an integral part of the body of Christ today. God has placed them within our bodies. And we have to make sure that they are healthy and spiritually alive. Yes. You see, children, are, their relationship to God is as important to God as our relationship to God. Mm -hmm. And this should motivate us toward ministry to the children. Well... Now, we know that TV has become a babysitter for children. And when parents don't want to take uh, responsibility for children, they send them to sit in front of their TV babysitter. How much time does TV take in the average child's life? Well, in 1978, there was a study done that said children watched an average of 15,000 hours of television before they graduated from high school, while only spending 11,000 hours in the classroom. In 1984, the same study was done, and the figure is up to 22,000 hours on the average in front of the television set. That's 1,000 hours a year increase. So with that and the 11,000 hours in school, we have 33 thousand hours of total input into a child's life before he's 18 years of age. 22,000 hours and a lot of that is taken up in cartoons, is that correct? Oh yes. More. Because we've noticed that the cartoons are not only just Saturday morning but every afternoon the children, they, they're at key times of the day when the children can watch them. Well a preschool age child will watch between 22 and 26 hours of television a week. At any time day or night preschoolers make up 22 percent of the television viewing audience. Now, when, when these children watch television, do they see it in the same way that we as adults do, or are they affected differently than adults? Children view television in a vastly different manner than adults do. In fact, until a child is about the age of seven, he cannot differentiate between fantasy and reality as it deals with the television. Mm -hmm. It's like you've turned on the TV is when you open the drapes to your living room window and sit them down and let them view their neighbors. And they see what's happening outside. In fact, I, I was watching TV when I was about two years old and turned it on and Lassie went running into a burning barn. And those words came on the screen that we've all come to hate to be continued. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I was, I was crying and very upset by this. And my dad was trying to comfort me and said, that's not real. That's just fantasy. But yeah. that didn't help because I believed it was real. I could not comprehend fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he finally faked a phone call to the TV producers to make sure she was okay. And that took care of it. And then you thought Lassie was okay because he supposedly called the producer. Yeah, to make sure. But what you're saying... Okay. Phil, is that the children cannot differentiate between that being a cartoon and fantasy. They think it actually represents a form of reality to yeah, them. Yeah, and no matter how much you try to explain it to them, it's developmentally beyond their capabilities to understand. Have you ever tried to tell a three-year-old kid, we'll do it tomorrow, they're back an hour later pulling on your pant leg going, is it tomorrow yet? All right. It's beyond their capabilities to understand time. So, being that children look at these things as reality, how do they view a commercial? Well, they view commercials as public service announcements. As though it's a really a happening that's really true. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think what we ought to do right now is show a commercial or two. We've got a couple from Masters of the Universe and also from Cookie Crisp. Let's watch those and we'll talk about sure. those right now. the Masters of the Universe collection. Each toy sold separately from Mattel. Look on to over a cookie crisp. It's the cookie crisp. I'm just checking the traffic. Cookie crisp. This steam to get cookie crisp isn't taking off. Who can blame me? It looks like little chocolate chip cookies. But cookie crisp cereal stays crispy in milk. And it's part of this complete breakfast. Well, Cookie Crook, it's time you started a new career. Yeah, this one's definitely winding down. If you like cookies... Now, Phil, you're saying that as the children watch these cartoons or these commercials, they're influenced by what they see. 
Oh, yeah. It, children, uh, uh, you see it on Saturday morning, they, they become glued to the television set. In fact, in fact, television reacts on a physical body much like an addictive drug. It brings you in a depressed state and you're watching it in this, in this depressed state. You've heard the terms glued to the television. Oh, yeah. You know, that type of thing. But uh, it's a physical reaction from your brain. So, so now, you're saying that the commercial ties also together with the toys because we saw the Masters of the Universe, this cyclone character that's just come out. What I'm trying to show through these commercials is that, is that when a child watches these about 30 times during a Saturday, he is programmed by the companies to be an advocate for their product. And that's when an intelligent mother walks out and buys a box of cereal that's over 50% sugar and feeds it to her kids knowing full well she, that kid's going to bounce off the walls in 20 minutes. You know? Because the child is going to be on her case and say, Mama, I want to eat cookie crisp until she finally gets it. Oh, yeah. You've never seen a, 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 a commercial, a cereal commercial for children during the Super Bowl or during 6 o'clock news. They don't care if you ever see it because they create an advocate within your home. Now, if they can do that with 30-second commercials, think what they can do with 30-minute cartoons. Okay, now let's go for a second. Here's a box of cereal, and there's little characters on here. Rainbow Bright, does this tie with any uh, toys that are out? Oh, yeah, they're starting to license a lot of the cereals to link with toys, and so it, it creates a greater desire for the toy and the cereal and other licensed products. And here's another one, G.I. Joe, and we know that a lot of his characters are out right now. And, and the G.I. Joe characters are getting occultic too, aren't they? Oh, yeah. yeah. We're seeing this more and more, and we'll show some of their characters a little later to show you just how occultic G.I. Joe is going. I think what we'd like to ask right now, Phil, is, is there any kind of uh, character that the, ch the girls can relate to? Well, there is, and her name is She-Ra, and there's another one that, uh, that is out there that is for girls, basically, and that's Golden Girls. Now, girls watch the other cartoons, too. One thing I'd like to do is tie all this information up that we've given people. You see, all this stuff links together because when a child watches the cartoon, they no longer, as we said in the first show, project themselves with their imagination into the toy and give it life, character, abilities, and talents and set the surrounding around it. They've been programmed by the cartoon to play with the toy in a certain manner. Uh -huh. and, and so if the cartoon says that a character has occult powers, then when the child plays with the toy, he is going to use that toy to cast spells or do whatever the toy does in the cartoon. And so he's programmed to play with the toy in a certain manner. Well, let's, let's take a toy, for instance. Then he'll take uh, the little He-Man, and he'll begin to yell those words by the power of Grace Grayskull and he'll begin to throw spells on people by his own imagination of powers and, and it really it gets the children looking into the occult for their powers, is that correct? Yeah. Creates a taste for the occult and, and they play with like Skeletor and they levitate him and, and then when they don't have the toys and they're on the playground then they take on these characters in fantasy role playing themselves and they imagine themselves with these occult powers. I got you. Well, let's go on now and show what the girls are identifying with which is She-Ra. Right. Here's, here's an opening to one of the She-Ra uh, cartoons and it shows her getting her powers also. Let's go to that right now. Adora, He-Man's twin sister and defender of the Crystal Castle. This is Spirit, my beloved steed. Fabulous secrets were revealed to me the day I held aloft my sword and said, For the honor of Grayskull! Others share this secret. Among them are Light Hope, Madame Raz, and Cowl. Together, we and my friends of the Great Rebellion strive to free Isheria from the evil forces of Horda. Well, there we saw She-Ra uh, with the same kind of, she said, by the power of Grayskull. And, Phil, as I'm watching this, I'm wondering, is uh, She-Ra as occultic, as blatantly occultic into witchcraft as He-Man? 
Well, the clip we have will show that she is, in some cases, even more occultic. What we're about to show in this next clip is, is a, a mystic competition on throwing and casting spells. And I think that would be very interesting for the people to see now. And this was taken right off TV. We didn't look for this. This was just the first thing we recorded. Yeah, everything's okay. been recorded. Let's the watch the week. competition of witchcraft here in she -Ra. Oh, wonderful, she -Ra. Absolutely wonderful. Pardon me, noble lady. May I enter this competition? Why, of course, my dear. In mystical, all are welcome to compete. Please go right ahead. In one great heap, dropping down, be still and sleep. Uh, must stop about you that are watching today but I'm absolutely shocked at what's being perpetrated on our children through these cartoons we've just watched a mystical world uh, called mystical or something like that and there's a witchcraft competition going on and this girl Shira, who is a myth mythical like a, a goddess to the children she's got occultic spells and incantations that are being thrown and I mean what are the implications of all this Phil well, it's direct link to the occult and, and pagan religion again. And we saw in there that She-Ra was sent to the sixth dimension. We're talking about Eastern religion. I mean, everything that has taken its basis from Hinduism uh, and, and other religions like that has been added into our toys and cartoons these days. Now, you talk about Hinduism. Would we see anything like the martial arts or... Uh you know, yoga exercises. Well, we did see yoga exercises last week in Skeletor taking that position. Uh, let's go on to Thundercats for a moment because I believe there's something to do with the martial arts in the Thundercats series. Yes, they, they are involved in the martial arts. They're also half men, half lion. Again, the beast man combination, much like many of the gods of the ancients were half men, half beasts, or hybrids. These are half men, half lions. And they do things like communicate with the dead and, and, uh, and have occult powers themselves. So let's go and look at the Thundercats right now, who we saw are taken from heathen gods of the past, ancient heathen gods. Here's Thundercats. been observing here there were gymnastics and martial arts type of uh, thrusting and, and jumping here with the Thundercats and again taken from Hinduism and ancient pagan symbolism 
but there's also what we saw here called the sword. Uh, it has the eye of Fundera. Do you, can you tell me anything about what the eye of Fundera is? The, the sword of omens that Lionel, the, the hero of this cartoon, carries is the object of the whole thing, trying to control this sword. Now, it's called the Sword of Omens, and there is an eye in the center called the Eye of Thundera. It's a red eye. Mm -hmm. And when placed to the forehead, you, it enables you to see into the future, to tell if there's danger around. Now, this third eye is mm. directly from the third eye of Hinduism. And when you travel through India, you notice that that third eye is almost always red. Absolutely. And so we're seeing, again, an occult practice in the children begin to pick up the idea that this third eye is part of everyday life and that they should look for things in their own lifestyles that would identify with Hinduism, the occult, and mystical Eastern religion. Creating a desire for the occult again. I'm absolutely astounded. And we noticed that Lino spoke with his dead father, as we're going to see in the next clip. I'd like to play another video segment from the Thundercats, who are half man and half beast that we saw earlier. We saw the martial arts segment, but let's show how occultic they really can become as we look at how they get into even talking with the dead. Here's Thundercats again. Good. Thundercats would never be able to resist an SOS from outer space. <laughs> but all they're heading for is a rendezvous with extinction. And I will be rid of the sword of omens forever! <laughs> Thundera is with you, Lionel, the source of the Thundercat's power. But I cannot summon it, Jaga. Shiner has sealed the eye. It sleeps, Jaga, and I cannot awaken it. Your young friend talks to himself. Jaga! Sealed or not, the eye sleeps only until needed. No, don't leave us, Jaga. The eye sleeps only until needed. seeing we're seeing this sort of omens that uh, this lion -o is using here and again it's absolutely occultic even to something that was taken like out of Star Wars it looks like he's talking to uh, like Obi-Wan Kenobi uh, little Luke Skywalker talked to him here we find lion -o talking to his dead father Jaga is that his mm -hmm. name yeah. Jaga Phil, what is this called when they talk to the dead? Uh, it's called necromology, and it's dealt with in Deuteronomy on a number of occasions, that this is something we're not even supposed to have in our homes. It's an abomination to God for us to speak to spirits of the dead or dead relatives, which are really only demons masquerading as dead ones. Right. And then he summons forth his sword, you know, and he summons it forth, and, and it levitates to his hand. <laughs> I couldn't believe some of the absolutely bizarre creatures there. The one was called Mumra, is that correct? Yes. Now, let, we have a cultic toy here that we bought in the store, which, is this Mumra? Well, the, it, it is part of Mumra. Mumra changes from a mummy that you saw on the screen to this figure right here. And Ra, again, is the, is the sun god Ra. Uh, and this is called the ever-living evil one. The ever-living evil one. Yeah. It's interesting, if I push the back of this doll, the uh, arms begin to move, and if you put a battery in the back, the eyes will light up, right. and it's a real, a very well-made uh, 
depiction of what's on the cartoon, and the children must play with this all the time. You'll notice the intertwined serpents on his front, and they're cobras again. The cobra, again, being the symbol of demonic power and protection. Totally amazing. I, I am uh, totally wiped out by what we're seeing here. So when we talk about the sort of omens and all of these things, again, the children are taught to identify with things that are occultic. Is that correct? Right. Well, Phil, what would you say the scripture would be for us to share with the people who are watching today? Well, I think probably the greatest scripture that we can share right now is 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. It talks about Eve being deceived by the serpent's cunning or trickery or plans. And she was deceived in her mind. She was not deceived in her flesh or her spirit, in her mind. And when she was deceived in her mind by the serpent's plans, she was led astray from a pure and sincere devotion to Christ or God. Now, our children don't have to wind up in the backyard sacrificing chickens to a moon god to be affected by the occult within the toys and cartoons. And you say some have even yelled out in parking lots, He-Man is more powerful than Jesus Christ. Right. All that has to happen is the, uh, for Satan to divert them from a pure and sincere relationship to God, and he's won. Yes. He doesn't have to get them totally involved in the occult, although that can happen, and this creates a desire and a taste for it. Well, let's tie this up today. I know some of you parents that are watching are already saying, I can't believe it. I let my children watch this on Saturday morning and on the weekdays, and they're totally involved with these characters. They act like them. I tell you what, you have a responsibility as a parent to stop the children from having these toys, from watching these cartoons, and we'll share later how you're responsible for that child. In the name of Jesus, I break every stronghold and I command that Satan lose his hold upon your household, and I praise God for it. Amen. See you next time. Greenwald, and today we're back with Phil Phillips, my special guest from Texas. Phil's a young man who's done an expose on occultic cartoons and toys that have come into our stores. Also, he's dealt with a lot of the comic books that are actually programming our children for witchcraft and the occult. And I asked Phil earlier how we got into this area, and he said that way back in the days of Ken and Barbie dolls, when uh, there was a humanism coming into all of the different toys that were made, we, we began to move this direction, and I thought maybe we would start out today by looking at Ken and Barbie. I mean, who would think anything could be wrong with Ken and Barbie, but let's, let's look at it from that aspect. Ken or Phil, what is it about uh, Ken and Barbie here? <laughs> well, obviously, looking at the two, they're perfect American dream type people. You know, Barbie is absolutely perfect. Perfect body, perfect hair, perfect clothes, perfect car, perfect house. And she has a perfect boyfriend who is also the absolute image, you know, that she has the clothes, the house, the car, everything material about them, it, it just flows right along. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. James Dawson puts it this way, Barbie has absolutely no blemishes except for made in Hong Kong stamped on her rear end. Right. And, uh, and, but there's a, someone who's a little more emotionally involved with Ken and Barbie than either me or Dr. James Dobson, and that would be Bill Barton. Now, most people don't know who Bill Barton is, but Bill Barton was the co-designer of Barbie. In a recent interview with Newsweek magazine, he contributed the current outbreak of anorexia nervosa, the self-imposed starvation syndrome, to the popularity of Barbie in the early, I mean, in the late 50s and early 60s. Is that right? Yes. And you, you mean the, the children were actually getting involved, uh, little girls would see Barbie being so perfect, so slender, and their reaction would be, I've got to be like her, so they'd start starving themselves. Yes, this man said that, that this doll creates unreal beauty expectations in little girls, and he has never given one of these dolls to any of his granddaughters. That's how much he believes in this. Yes. And she is a perfectly uh, made little girl, and this is where there's a little danger in the Ken and Barbie dolls. Well, Barbie pretty perfectly okay for early adolescent teenager, but that's not who plays with them. It's young little girls, 
and they should be playing with soft mothering type dolls, learning mothering qualities instead of learning fashion and, well, of and course, that type of thing at that age. We're not going to say that there's anything really wrong with these dolls, except that every doll a child plays with conditions him to vicariously live his life through that doll. And what was that statement you made earlier that God spoke to you and said what dolls would do? Well, children project themselves with their imagination into toys. They give them life, character, abilities, and talents, and they set the surrounding around it. You see, toys are symbols yes. that guide children through different situations. And these symbols set the stage for their qualitative judgments later on in life. Well, let's go from there. We're talking about humanistic type of toys. Let's go into the more blatantly occultic things. Yes. I remember a couple of years ago, I preached a message for television called Dungeons and Dragons. And in it, I dealt with the occultic overtones, the witchcraft, the demonism, the spells uh, that were perpetrated through the game Dungeons and Dragons. And I felt at the time that children were identifying so closely with those little uh, pieces in the game that we even had uh, paper, newspaper clippings of children that had dropped out. Some uh, they thought had even committed suicide because of the game. Yes. And even more has come to light since then. And I wanted to show a clip from Dungeons and Dragons right now showing the occultic overtones of the game. So here's from the cartoon show that's now come from the game. Here it is, Dungeons and Dragons. Repairs will be completed, and your work will be done now for. Your ship shall make me more powerful than ever. Well, what is it? The lost children have been spotted in the forest nearby with dungeon masters, young ones. Good. Now we can eliminate them all. No. What? If you harm those children, I will work no more. Is that so? Threats in little to me, Avenger. As you wish. Shadow Demon. See that they are captured and bring them to me. But go and do not harm them. Well, Phil, we've been watching a, a, a character here called Venger and another black creature called Shadow Keeper, what, what do they represent to you? Well, I believe that it's a direct depiction of Satan and his demon uh, powers and demon friends. Uh, uh, they go forth for him. Uh, I believe that Dungeons and Dragons is a direct uh, quote from the pit of hell, if you want to call it that. Uh, it is a mind-bending game, a mind-changing game. It is involved with all kinds of occult and pagan religion. The player's handbook includes over 160 pages of spells to be cast. Let's look at one of the handbooks here. This is the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, the Monster Manual. And it's full of monstrous figures and actually those creatures that the children can m imagine. And yes. children's imaginations are very active, aren't they? Yes, very much so. Now, let's look at another one of these. This is where we go into the Dungeon Master's Guide. Who is the Dungeon Master? Well, the Dungeon Master is a person who plays God in the game. And, uh, and he controls all the situations. In fact, the books tell him that he is, he is the God of the game. And, uh, and he controls the situations in the game, controls the way the players are moving through the dungeons. And then, uh, then if he doesn't like someone, he can play it pretty much against them. Do you think parents are aware that when the children play the game that demon spirits are involved? I do not think that many parents are aware of what's inside the game. In fact, in my presentation, I show many pictures from the inside of the books just to show the images of this game. I yes. mean, the gruesomeness of this game and the occult link to it. Well, I know that when uh, I did my message, and this has happened, I have letter after letter where people took the pieces. Now, there's sixes involved in the pieces of the game, but they yes. take the pieces of the game, they would throw them in the incinerator or the fireplace, and screams would come out because there seemed to be some kind of spiritual forces inhabiting those pieces, and children would drop out of life. They didn't want to study anymore. Uh, what, what are the pieces, for instance? Well, this game affects the most intelligent of our children. And the pieces include white witches, wizards, necromancers, the, the clerics, that type of thing. It includes evil wizards. It's a white versus black witchcraft. 
the good versus evil is white versus black witchcraft. And Anton LaVey, the writer of the Satanist Bible, says there is no such thing as white witchcraft. Well, being a Satan worshiper, he should know. Yeah, he should know that, that all the power from Satan is going to create evil and havoc. And what it shows is it shows a good versus evil, that good has about the same equality of power as evil, and they come head on, head on in collision, where that's not the outline we see in the Bible. We see a good that is all-powerful, that has taken dominion of the world, that created the world, yes. and we see Satan who's been defeated. Absolutely. And that's what we want our children to know, that Jesus is greater than Satan. He right. has won all the way. He, he's he's the, the conqueror. Now, let me read you one quick letter here, the cassette uh, this is a letter that came from a lady that had heard my cassette on Dungeons and Dragons and she just mentions how it changed the personality of her young boy. The, she says, the cassette from the Eagle's Nest especially helped me with my boy who was involved with D&D at a private high school which promoted D&D as part of their attractive strategic game club. She says, for a period of about six months we lost Tonio, our son. He became rebellious, disrespectful, lethargic. He made sneering faces at us and carried with him a very hostile spirit that could be felt wherever he went in the house. After much sorrow, Tonio finally let go of D&D &D only after his father forbid the game as his day's pastime. He couldn't make it his day's pastime. She said he had put aside all studies for this game. Now, I want to say that the reason the danger comes into this is that not only is it a game now but the cartoons which the children even identify more strongly with are now coming up with D&D &D cartoons of the occult. Let's see another segment of a D&D &D cartoon where there's blatant occultism and witchcraft. Here's the cartoon. I think she was in trouble when she left. In truth, there's a 97% chance that something unexpected has happened to your friend. Oh, brother. Ovino is right. Dungeon Master! In fact, you are all in great danger. No kidding. However, through defeat, you shall find victory. What's that supposed to mean? Well, we're seeing here, Phil, all kinds of demonic creatures. Anything else you want to say about Dungeons & Dragons? Well, the fact is, is that this... Uh, this toy and cartoon series is bringing the occult to younger and younger children in a very real way. Well, let's go on to some other occultic figures. I see one on the screen here, which we call Black Star. Can you tell us about him? Black Star is probably one of the most blatantly occultic toy series on the market today because with every figure such as Kadar, the invincible wizard that you're seeing here, comes its own glow-in-the-dark alien demon. This glows in the dark? Right. Now, the average child will own $72 worth of any toy series they get involved with, which means that they could own 4 to 12 of these glow-in-the-dark alien demons here. Now, can you imagine a child doesn't clean up his room at night or displays the toys on a shelf, and he wakes up looking at this thing glowing at him in the dark? I can't, I can't believe that we could have toys that are absolutely... Uh... I mean, even the eyes look like they glow here. Yeah. It's, it's totally occultic. You know, before we go on to this one, let's look at a couple of occultic games. Uh, okay. I have a let's few here that. that we picked up at the toy store. We went out and we picked up a few. Now, this is uh, the Infac Infaciables, <laughs> Mystic Warriors of Change, and the faces change in these, don't they? Right, right. It's a man-to-beast uh, combination again. Uh, I don't know much about this toy series, of course, they come out so fast it's pitiful. Here's another one, uh, another uh, man-to-beast transformation where you can turn around the head inside and uh, these seem to be very occultic in their overtones. Of course, transforming from a man to an animal is a, is a very occultic and new age concept. Let's look at uh, another one here which we found in the store called the Sectors, Warriors of Symbi Symbion. And it says, now the battle is in your hands. Very interesting. 
and they see that. Let me take this out of the box and I'll show you that it actually does some tricks. Now this is where a child can identify with this and actually take this out of the box and uh, put it on his hand, no less. So let me see if I can put my hand in here. <laughs> oh no, unbelievable. Get my fingers in the different glove parts here and then this creature actually begins to uh, open its mouth and move its legs. Isn't that incredible? And so they can make it take on life. It says here that uh, it actually makes the wings move, so let me, uh, look at that. Isn't that amazing? And do you remember those uh, verses in the book of Revelation about the flying beast with the riders on them? The flying beast with the riders on them. So you this know, is the winged, the winged horses. This could actually be taken from uh, Revelations. Sure, it looks like it. I cannot believe it. Well, if this is the direction that the occultic toys are taking, what is where are we going? Wh where do you think it's going to? Well, it's going to bring the occult into every home, and you know that that uh, that the Lord said some very powerful things in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 11 on the occult, and I'd like to read those scriptures. Yeah, what does God say? When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of the times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. So, actually, another scripture says that if you bring an abomination or an accursed thing into your house, then you will be accursed like it is. Would you say these toys are accursed to God? Oh, I would guarantee it. The so, toys and the cartoons. So the minute you turn your TV on, you, you've broken this scripture here. So a parent who allows, allows his child to watch this on television and also brings these toys into the home or buys them for the child is actually breaking a commandment of God and inviting curses upon the family. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it, the Bible talks about not, not taking uh, uh, counsel from ungodly counsel. Well, bringing a TV into your home is like taking counsel and if you, if you watch ungodly programs, you're taking counsel from ungodly counsel. Well, Phil, now I think a lot of this can even go back, if we might divert, back to some of the movies that have been coming out, like Star Wars and uh, the Jedi, Return of the Jedi, and so forth. Uh, what is this creature we're looking at, at on our screen from... Uh... Well, this is Squidhead. He's from Star Wars. And as you know, Star Wars told us that the Force would be with us. It, uh, uh, and, of course, the Force... Is, uh, is a word used by witches down through the centuries to describe the power they receive from Satan. Uh, characters like Darth Vader, who look almost exactly like the ancient Norse god Odin, and uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and there's a form of witchcraft called Obi Witchcraft, in which chanting Obi, Obi, Obi over and over again releases the power into the witches' lives. You're saying that these were actually taken, this was taken from a Norse god, uh, who well, looked very much it, like yes, him. Yes, it looks a lot like Darth Vader. Uh, I wish we could go back one slide and look at that Norse god, but uh, we can't go backward yeah. on these? Okay. We're looking at Yoda right now, and, uh, and Yoda was called the Zen Master. Of course, this was based on Zen Buddhism. Zen Buddhism says there's one force in the world, and it can be either used for good or evil. And, uh, and Yoda's called the Zen Master. He's always seen with serpents around him or serpents around yeah, his neck. Yeah, look at the serpents around yeah. his neck there. He is, you know. he is a three-fingered, three-toed beast. So he has the two fingers and the thumb, which from my information means Satan is Lord. Right. Now, let's take it up right now with uh, another creature by Steven Spielberg, I believe it is, from E.T., the extraterrestrial. What, do you, what can we say about him? Well, E.T. smashed box office records in 1982 by doing $318 million. $318 million? million. Yes, it was a camouflage occult movie, including uh, levitation, psychic healing, mind control, uh, mental telepathy, that type of thing. E.T. also included some inferences to homosexuality within, uh, within the movie. Homosexuality? Yes. Uh, this is uh, this creature E.T. became like a lovable little toy that every child wanted to have in his home, and this is just one of many. Now E.T. I mean we we saw the little guy with healing power in his finger. Yes. 
and uh, levitation ability, and he just brought all of this into the minds and thinking of the children. Would we say that this is a, a plot to... Uh, well, I think one of the things they tried to do on this, this movie is to make people accept that there's more Christ than just one. You know, many, many times that the Hindus, and they believe that there's a, a, a multiples of Christ, and they come at different occasions and different times. And so I think that's what happened in this movie. It was a, uh, a falsification of Christ coming to earth and trying to get us to believe that, hey, you know, if E.T. is an alien and he came down and he did all the things that he did and he died and was resurrected again, then what about Jesus? Maybe he was an alien. Well, with these aliens, also the cartoon shows are bringing these uh, superheroes that come from other planets like Clark Kent, uh, who is Superman and so forth. Can we talk about the superheroes for a moment? Well, many of our superheroes have occult powers. We know that Superman's dead father speaks to him and gives him guidance. We know that many of them have other occult powers that they're involved in. And, and they're also seen with occult figures, as we'll see in some of these comic books that are coming up. Here's Wonder Woman. Now, she has occult powers herself, but sh you see these demons coming out of a fiery pit, and she's involved with the demons. Well, when you, when you talk about Wonder Woman, here's one of the toys we bought of Golden Girl. Yeah. And all of these uh, comics and cartoons are spawning toys that the children can identify with. Yes, Golden Girl is a new series aimed at girls. It's, it's aimed at yeah. girls specifically. Yes, very, very much interesting. So. It's a new action figure series. Well, we thought we'd show that because a lot of the girls are now getting in on the action. Yes, what do we have here? This is The Thing and The Scarlet Witch. Power Man and Son of Satan. Son of Satan. Now they're yes. getting kind of blatant. And this is the Burning Hand. Now in the Burning Hand, we have a depiction of Jesus Christ crucified on a pentagram of five-pointed occultic star. Unbelievable. That is the, the star of Satan. The five-sided star is a pentagram and it represents the goat's head and here it actually do you see the direction that the cartoons are going and the comic books they're showing jesus christ as defeated and crucified by the occultic powers i, I just i just can't believe this it, it is phenomenally blatant and it is affecting children today well what else do we have on these occultic uh, comic well books? We're, we're starting to see violence within the toy series in a greater and greater way. Masters of the Universe averages 37 violent acts every half hour. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons averages 67 violent acts every half hour. And then there's the granddaddy on Maul's G.I. Joe, and which is also matched by Transformers, which does over 80 violent acts every half hour. And in that, we compare that to a very violent adult television show, which averages four to six violent acts every half hour, and a cartoon like like Bugs Bunny Roadrunner, which averaged about 11 violent acts. I would like to say also that in the Bible, God says that he cast Lucifer, Satan, out of heaven because he was so filled with violence. And we know that in Hosea 4.2 it says, there is swearing, deception, murder, stealing, and adultery. They employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed. I was absolutely amazed recently when I went into the toy stores and I saw that there were complete racks filled with grenades, uh, rocket launchers, all kinds of knives and guns and, uh, I mean, squirt guns that uh, are so occultic in that, are not occultic, but violent in that they depict real firearms used in wars. And I thought we would start today by showing you a clip from G.I. Joe. So let's go into uh, like a, a commercial of a G.I. Joe, Joe, Joe toy series. Introducing the leaders of the Crimson Guard, the evil twin brothers Tomax and Sabot, and they're getting away in the Cobra Ferret. The Joes will stop them. With the G.I. Joe mini G.I. Joe! Cobra! Evil twin brothers sold together Cobra Ferret, G.I. Joe mini tank, and Joe Baker sold separately from Hasbro. Adventures of the Joe Team five days a week as they battle the evil forces of Cobra. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. It's the most exciting. Well, 
Phil, as we're watching these G.I. Joe commercials, can we say that they're also helping sell toys and even cereal? Oh, yeah, the, the cartoons and the commercials are helping selling the toys and the cereal. I think we ought to show the toy to start out today. Uh, you know, G.I. Joe years ago used to be a guy that wore khakis and uh, was just sort of a soldier, but now he's taken on an occultic look, hasn't he? Yeah, they're slowly but surely weaving in the occult and mainly in the, in the martial arts and different things like that within G.I. Joe. Sort of a futuristic look as we see on this uh, figure on our monitor here. Uh, he's taking on the look of the future soldier, so yes, to speak. very much. And a lot of the movies are depicting that, too. I see a real trend toward uh, what I call the barbarization of our children, where through, uh, through these violent movies and violent cartoons, they're teaching our children that the way to handle problems is through violence. And now, also, the violence is helping sell cereal, correct? Right. And here we have a G.I. Joe cereal uh, box. And what we're really concerned about is not selling cereal, though. We're concerned about the trend towards teaching the children to have violent attitudes. Oh, yes. And, and we see things such as flat gum, you know, that look like shrapnel coming what, what, out. Now, wait a minute. Flat gum. Yeah, it's, it comes in a pouch, and it looks like pieces of shrapnel. Uh, in fact, one I was listening to one uh, commentator talk about the feelings within Russia. And he said that the Russians were were more upset about this new trend in America, the children wearing the fatigues and being more militaristically minded than they were about our nuclear arms. You're kidding me. Yeah, very much so. In other words, this is a threat to Russia because they see our children being programmed to want to carry guns around and to shoot people and to rocket launch and so forth. And that's what bothered me as I went through the toy store seeing that parents were buying all of these occultic toys from grenades to gum that you chew that's uh, supposed to be shrapnel that uh, yeah now here's a uh, Rambo gun that we picked up at one of the stores and of course Rambo is an extremely popular movie but this is a squirt gun that's battery operated and squirts 30 feet but that's not so bad it's just the children get the feeling that guns are in now that yeah. uh, shooting people is in oh they really are and and uh, and rambo and other movies like this have glorified violence and and the hero never gets hurt i mean he's hardly ever even scathed you know it's it doesn't give a real picture of war and people say well the bible is a violent book but if you look at the bible the violence took place over hundreds of years, not, not such in a compacted 90-minute package with thousands of acts of violence or a compacted 30-minute cartoon with 80 violent acts on the half hour. Well, I think, Phil, as we're looking at this, we're seeing a trend that is leading towards what we now call uh, our transformer toys, which transform from uh, uh, a, a weapon to a robot type of creature right. and we're going to get into talking about robots and transformers but let's talk about some of the more innocuous things that are on the market that are leading into these things uh, I mean what could we call uh, something like Smurfs is there anything occultic or dangerous about Smurfs well Smurfs happens to be the most popular Saturday morning cartoon since the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner hour it came it's just entered into uh, uh, a long-term run, and it's hit an hour and a half on Saturday morning cartoons. But there are some things about Smurfs that we need to look at. First of all, you'll notice that they're depicted as blue with black lips. Well, isn't that interesting? And you know what happens to you when you die. You turn blue and your lips turn black. In other words, these are depictive of uh, dead creatures. Right. And another thing is that Smurfs is an all-male community. And you say, oh, there's Smurfette. She's a female. Well, in one cartoon, she was depicted as transforming from a male to a female through magical power. And so the only female in the Smurfs is transformed from a male. She was not born a female. No, what you're telling me then is that even Smurfs carry a homosexual connotation in that most of them are male. I believe so. But we're, we're not going to blatantly say that Smurfs are evil. We're just saying that they have all of these overtones that are leading that direction. Well, let's take another look at Smurfs. Because the Smurfs cartoon, the whole uh, storyline, is that the Smurfs get in trouble. 
And every time they get in trouble, they run to Papa Smurf, who whips up a spell or an incantation to get them out. In fact, he said the name Beelzebub numerous times in the cartoon. And he whips up this spell, spell or incantation and, and draws them out of their problems You're through kidding. witchcraft. And then they have an enemy called Gargamel. Now, Gargamel, in a recent episode, I saw him draw a five-pointed star, the pentagram, on the ground. Right. He lit candles at each point, which is an actual witchcraft practice. He started to dance inside the pentagram, chanting a magical chant. At that point, a book opened up across the room, and something left the book and entered his physical body, giving him power to levitate and to to do battle against the Smurfs. Oh no. So so we can say that Smurfs has gone occultic. Very much so. Well, how about something innocuous like uh, the Care Bears? Aren't they very popular? Well, Care Bears is very popular and it, it was started by Hallmark Cards as a very innocent thing and then they've licensed out and some things have taken place in Care Bears that need to be talked about. And one of those things took place in the Care Bear movie. If we could look at some slides of the Care Bears, maybe we could uh, get an idea of what we're talking about. Now, this is in the Care Bear movie. Now, the little boy is, is an, uh, an orphan, and he kind of goes to this circus, and, and he's being real mistreated. And he walks over to this table, and this book, a face comes out of it and calls him over and tempts him to open the book. Right. And he opens it up, and the face starts to talk to him and starts to teach him how to practice the occult. In a Care Bear comic book? Yes. And then he tries to go against the book, and again, the, you see the face coming out of the book. The, book. the occult book talks to him, guides him, leads him. You see him here looking over a cauldron, and what he's looking over the cauldron, he's looking to see the, the children and see what they're doing. And at the end, the Care Bears, to take care of their problems, use the Care Bear Stare, which is a power beam coming from the center of their stomach. Now, this, what I'm seeing in Care Bears is almost like they're setting up their own religion, that children are to tell these Care Bears their problems instead of telling their God or mom and dad. And they're to, they're to depend on the Care Bears to take away all their troubles. And then we see the occult coming in to the cartoon series. Absolutely. I, I wonder if we might do a cutaway to a cartoon video that we have uh, showing some of the occultic overtones in even the Care Bears and the different types of uh, series here. We're looking at the Littles. The Littles? Okay, yeah. this is the Littles. We're going to move from the Care Bears to the Littles now. Rejoice, my people. After 4,000 years, the stars are in alignment. By tomorrow's sunset, our Pharaoh will return. Well, obviously, as we're looking at uh, Isis and uh, the Littles, now, who are the Littles? Well, the Littles are little people. They're like little uh, elves or something like that. And they're supposed to be real cute, you know, and, and this guy takes care of them, and they have a little land, you know, where they live in. But as you saw in that clip, even something that is not based on the occult will bring in occult images through other things. So here they showed this pagan worship and, and the worship of the Pharaoh gods. Well, and it looked very Egyptian to me. And yes. It looked like they were worshiping Isis, which is an Egyptian goddess, I believe. Yes. And so we're looking at total occultism, paganism, that's being taught to our children through these, these little innocuous cartoons. Now, go ahead. In fact, one of the most innocent, if you could pick up that pony there, yeah. is one called My Pony. This now, is My Pony. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you walk through a toy store, and you walk into that toy store and, and you see these ponies, say, oh, they're cute. They're blue and they're purple and they're pastel colors and they're different ponies and you notice they have like a rainbow colored in their hair and they're just so cute. Now, wait know? a minute. This is not a pony, though. This is yeah. a uh, unicorn. Right. A unicorn. And the unicorn and Pegasus are used in this My Pony series and a combination of the two. Now, both of those things came 
from mythologies. The Pegasus came from Greek mythology and the unicorn came out of the black forest of Germany and, and from that area and through the Dark Ages. Now in one of the cartoons that featured my pony, now this is supposed to be super cute, okay, yeah. for little girls, we saw a, uh, a pan, which is a half man, half horse. He had horns coming out the side of his head, a huge thing, with an amulet around his neck, who kidnapped uh, three of the ponies, and he's going to transform them to pull his chariot of darkness. And he takes open a bag and he says, look into evil. And out of that bag rushes a spirit power which transforms these three ponies into dragons. Now this is aimed at little, little girls and boys. I can see that we're actually destroying our children by letting them watch even the innocuous things because they're all going that direction. Yeah. How about Rainbow Bright? This is another uh, figure that a lot of children well, are into. Again, Rainbow Bright is a very humanistic type toy. It, uh, it, it displays many humanistic and new age symbols within it. They also do use magic with inside Rainbow Bright. Well, here's a Rainbow Bright uh, cereal box. And, uh, I mean, what are you saying about Rainbow Bright? Again, she's, it's a humanistic emblems and, and uh, humanistic value system. Well, the rainbow represents the, uh, the, the uh, networking movement. of the New Age. Right. And it's interesting that she has a little five-sided star on her cheek. I don't know if you can see that on the box, but there's a little five-sided star, and it's upside down, which I'm not going to say it's used in this depiction, but that's a pentagram again. Yes. And uh, there, that's another uh, New Age and occultic symbol. So we have to be careful even with uh, Rainbow Bright. Yeah, and, and the cute toys need to be looked at too. We need to use discretion when we buy toys for our children. Well, let's jump from the cute little toys into the robots and the transformers, as we call them. And I think what we ought to do is show a video cut of uh, the robots and transformers. So let's come back after uh, a short robot craze here. Okay. Phil, who is this uh, creature sort of that they're all talking to in this? Well, this is the king of, of the land that they lived in. Now, he is dead. That's his ghost speaking to Again, them. speaking in necromancy where right. they're speaking to the dead. Right, and he's giving them guidance and he's finding out information and telling them where the keys are that will activate this Voltron robot. Now, Voltron is a robot designed to defend the universe. Again, everything is, is going to is this, take care of the whole universe. This is the toy then, the Voltron toy that uh, we're going to be discussing right now. And we'll have another video clip in a minute, but... Uh, this is the toy, Voltron, and uh, before uh, we come back from this little uh, cut uh, roll-in, I'm going to take him out so you can see a little more of what we're talking about. Some of you that are watching today might want to receive all the cassettes that uh, cover the message that Phil's been sharing today because we've dealt with everything from occulty cartoons to toys to innocuous little figures to the new craze in comic books, and I'd like to make those available to you as well as my cassette on Dungeons & Dragons and we have some other little added bonuses today, so let me bring the announcer on right now and he'll explain how you can get all these. Here's our announcer. As you've been watching today's shocking interview, many of you may want to share this message with family and friends. Evil powers are trying to brainwash this generation of children, but the truth will set them free. You can take that truth to them. Let's pray that churches across the nation will rise up and expose this deception of a generation. Today's interview includes materials taken and now offered in three cassette messages. The cassettes include Spiritual Warfare in Your Child and Deception of a Generation, both by Phil Phillips. The third cassette is titled Dungeons and Dragons by Gary Greenwald. As a bonus, the Eagle's Nest is including the book, Breaking Spiritual Dullness and Barriers in Children, an outstanding expose of many of the evil deceptions being perpetrated on young people today. You'll also receive Phil Phillips' newspaper titled, Child Effects, updating you on the latest occultic attacks on your children. To receive all three cassettes, the book and the newspaper, simply request the Child Deception Offer and send any donation of $15 or more to The Eagle's Nest, Post Office Box 15,000, Santa Ana, California, 92705. Again, request the Child Deception Offer 
and send $15 or more to The Eagle's Nest, Post Office Box 15,000, Santa Ana, California, 92705. May the Lord bless you and your stand for righteousness. And now back to Gary Greenwald and Phil Phillips. Now, Phil, we're talking about uh, Voltron, and uh, can you tell us real quickly who Voltron is? Well, Voltron is a combination of five lion robots into one large robot. Again, he's going to defend the universe. And, uh, and in this, they also have a witch within this uh, uh, cartoon, and there are a lot of occultic symbolisms within it, such as the stars and that type of thing. Right. Well, let's uh, go to another video clip that shows a little bit of Voltron and the witchcraft that's involved in these different cartoon segments. So here's Voltron. Well, Phil, there's no doubt that there's witchcraft here. And Voltron is very similar to what we call the Transformer series, isn't he? Yes. This is one of many robot series. Some of them are sexually oriented. Some of them have, have no occult or, or anything in it. The Transformers, I've not seen occult in it yet, but it's an extremely violent show. And in fact, it's the only violent cartoon that actually shows killing in it that I've seen and as we'll see in the next clip you'll see someone get shot and killed. Let's go into a segment, a video segment of the Transformers. Let's cut away right now and see the violence that's depicted. Are you raw materials or energy? Oh, uh, we only store energy here. That's just what I wanted to hear. Decepticons, attack! <laughs> Phil, not only is there occultic overtones here, but definite violence and killing, and this could lead the children to think that killing is okay, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. So what are we as parents? What, what can we do? What is our response? Well, the responsibility lies on the parents to train up their child, to, to guide that child. In fact, the word training in the Greek means to narrow the child, like a river flowing through a canyon, and that river is narrowed and guided in the way it should go. But you know who's really responsible for this? It's, it's the people who are supposed to provide the spiritual priesthood within a family, and that's the fathers. See, the, the fathers are, are commanded by God to be the priest of their home, but many fathers don't take that seriously. And if fathers would take that seriously and expect God to them, anoint them to lead their families and anoint them to, to guide their children in the way they should go and to bring about spiritual change within the home and to eliminate the things that are going to hinder their children's spiritual walk because they will be held accountable for what happens to their children Especially spiritually. Especially the fathers. Yes, definitely. Well, the Bible says that God will turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers in Isaiah 54. Four. Do you have any scripture that would indicate the father's responsibility? I know we're told to put the word before the children. Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it talks about uh, uh, training up, uh, teaching the child on a daily basis, speaking the word to that child as they rise up in the morning, as they go along the way, as they go to bed. And it even goes so far as to, to tell us to put preeminence on the word by tying it to the wrist or to the forehead. We're not talking about that, but what the inference there was that the word of God is to take preeminence within our homes and that we're to speak our relationship to the Lord to our children, we're to tell them how God has interacted in our lives, how God has healed us, how God has brought us into prosperity, how God saved us and brought us out of Egypt type thing, out of the spiritual bondage that we were in, and how God can do that for the child. And that's what we relate to Him. And we talk about our relationship with the Lord on a daily basis. Yes. 
I think that right now we should really reiterate, you parents that are watching today, it is your responsibility. If you allow your children to watch these cartoons, if you allow them to bring these comic books into the house, if you allow them to have these toys or you buy them for them, you're going to be held responsible before God. God says not to bring an accursed thing into your house, lest you should be accursed as it is. These things are occultic, they're accursed. They teach the children to get into spells and to witchcraft and to serve demon powers and demon occultic uh, pagan religions are, uh, the mystic religions of the East are all propagated through this. And I pray in the name of Jesus today that any of you that have this, ba this bondage in your household, your children are rebellious and, and being drawn by these things. I pray in Jesus' name that God would break that bondage today. We loose it right now and we put the blood of Jesus over you, your family, and your children. God bless you now from the Eagle's Nest. Thank you for joining us today for Eagle's Food from the Eagle's Nest with Gary Greenwald. This outreach of Eagle's Nest Ministries is made possible through your continued prayer and love gift. For a copy of today's message, or a catalog of other messages by Gary Greenwald, please write to The Eagle's Nest, Box 15,000, Santa Ana, California, 92705. That's The Eagle's Nest, Box 15,000, Santa Ana, California, 92705. Join us again next time for more Eagle's Food from The Eagle's Nest.